you, John, for this introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, do I change here with this? Um, what do I do here? Exactly? Yeah, that's, that's right. As you, also, as you all know, uh, Mantle lymphoma is a rare lymphoma subtype. It's only. Is there data here? That should be here. Sorry? Hmm. Oh, that okay. So I thought it was I thought it was in built in. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> very good. As you all know, it's a quite rare disease. It's six percent of the non Hodgkin lymphoma. It is a disease of the elderly. Median age is about seventy, <coughs> and the majority of patients are above six, older than sixty years. It's also widespread at diagnosis. You can see here the majority are in stage four at diagnosis in this Scandinavian population-based study here. So it's certainly relevant to think of the elderly when you think about treating mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, in the original non hodgkin lymphoma project, it turned out that mantle cell lymphoma was one of the ugliest subtypes in terms of, of survival with only a three-year median survival, uh, confirmed in many other uh, studies. Also the German uh, perspective uh, data from, from the uh, 70s and 80s, the three-year survival, but also based on perspective data, it turned out when you improve the therapy, you can also improve survival to about meter of five years with chemotherapy, which is also relevant for elderly people including CHOP and in, in a minority R-CHOP in this uh, time period here. So uh, it was the old saying that mantle lymphoma is one of the worst uh, NHL subtypes, but it is actually heterogeneic, which is also very relevant in terms of treating elderly people. As you all know, the fundamental lesion in mantle lymphoma is the translocation 1114, leading to cyclic D1 overexpression and interfering with the cell cycle, but also further genomic aberrations of the cell cycle and DNA damage pathway developed during time, leading to classical mantle lymphoma or blastoid mantle lymphoma. And also, uh, <coughs> campus group and many others have looked at the transcription factor succinamine, and it turns out there are sort of two pathways of developing. There are two subtypes of mantle cell lymphoma based on the succinamine uh, expression. And uh, succinamine is a transcription factor, as we just heard, promotes MCN tumor growth in, in vivo and regulates B cell differentiation, cell proliferation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, and is direct targeting PAX5, which uh, block differentiation into plasma cells. That's hopefully not me. I can just switch it off, but it's not me. Um, so based on uh, the expression of SOX11, there are two, uh, two ways of differentiating into the SOX11 positive, which is the majority of the classical MCL, aggressive disease which does not enter the germinal center. It's IGH3 unmutated pre preferentially, genetically unstable, spreads to lymph nodes, and uh, to aggressive disease. And then there's the SOX11 negative patients. It's, it's a, sub a subset which do enter the germinal center and acquires IGHV mutation. And it's genetically more stable, and it spreads to blood and the spleen, and it's a stable disease. And this is the uh, also, campus group, Fernandez and colleagues, showing the, uh, <coughs> the uh, huge, much better prognosis of the SOX11 negative patients than the SOX11 positive. I must mention there is a sort of dispute about SOX11, and we in the Nordic have some findings uh, suggesting that SOX11 negative was actually a bad subset, but that was, in my opinion, due to 
that many of these patients had TP53 aberrations. Uh, so I think the, 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 the image was blurred some, somehow. So I actually believe in this model myself. Also, uh, knowing disease is heterogeneic, some people do not have symptoms or a serious organ, uh, organ uh, uh, dysfunction at diagnosis, so you can actually watch and wait. And some of these patients will, of course, be the SOX11 negative patients. And this is a Martin's study from 2009 showing that you can defer treatment uh, up to several years, actually, and there was no uh, worsening that it, you did not lose anything by waiting to treat these patients until they get symptoms completely like CLL. Also, due to this heterogeneity, the German group Eva Hoster and colleagues developed the MIPI, the Madden Cell International Pronostic Index, based on age, performance status, LDH, and white, and white blood cell count. And they can also combine it with the uh, key 67, which is the single most important biological factor for the production of mantle cell lymphoma, this uh, proliferation protein. <clears throat> and getting a very clear separation of, of three, uh, three causes of disease, and it's very, very useful, and you can easily uh, calculate it on the net. So don't sit with your, your pocket counter, but go to the net and calculate the MIPI, and you can get a good estimate. And I think it belongs to the, uh, when you get a patient stage for, for men, but this is also a thing that should be done very easily. Go and do this. Okay. So there is room for improvement. We have two subgroups with quite uh, poor, poor outcome, and uh, what can we do? We can, is it antibodies? Can we identify the induction treatment? We could see the German data that it helped to uh, add azacyclines to, to the uh, chemotherapy going to 2025 two, two, years of median survival. What about targeted therapy? What about maintenance? So. Let me go through these uh, in the next slide, and I'll start with the first line uh, therapy. And the antibody about rituximab, there's uh, an abundance of data showing that rituximab is, is of benefit in man's cell lymphoma. There's the old Lens data, 2005, time to treatment failure. There's uh, Simon's data, quite new data, with RFC versus FC uh, showing benefit of PFS. And then there are big population-based uh, studies, the American and the European, the Nordic data here showing huge benefit of rituximab in first line, but also probably in second line therapy. What about incentivizing induction therapy? Uh, in the European group where we participated, uh, we tried to do that by randomizing elderly patients untreated between eight cycles of r and six cycles of RFC. And then there was a second randomization of the responders to either maintenance with interferon or rituximab. And uh, it's, a, it's a complicated, the results are complicated. It turned out that actually FC, which is a better regimen, it, but, but it was too toxic. So uh, there was more toxicity in the FCR arm leading to less treatment and more progression. And also more of these HPG who made it actually, that died in CR due to infections. So the result is that the survival was actually poorer in the FCR, while, while the type of treatment failure was the same. So, so you lost patients due, because this was actually too toxic. And uh, as also as a CLL man, I must say, I, I forgot my old wisdom about fit and unfit in CLL because it's well known to all of you here also that we don't just go out and offer RFC to elderly unfit patients in CLL, so why could we do it in men's telephone? That's So uh, how do I go back now? That's here. 
the important find the other important finding of the study was that <coughs> when you maintain the chop the the R chop patients uh, receiving maintenance with rituximab had a huge survival benefit of the antibody, whereas the RSC patients uh, did not. Uh, also supporting the idea that uh, the FC is actually more effective if you can tolerate it. So they had less uh, residual disease and no less benefit of the, of the treatment. So now this has become standard of therapy, uh, maintenance with the after after ARCHOP and also in my practice after I have been the most and the source. Whereas we should uh, recognize that after all, the we can, it's limited how much we can intensify, intensify reduction therapy in men's lymphoma, in the elderly patients. So uh, what about uh, targeted therapy? And there are many drugs here also, which Catherine has uh, mentioned in detail, lilidomide, uh, bortezomib, uh, mTOR inhibitors, uh, BCI inhibitors, and BCA2 inhibitors. So I think the time is working for elderly patients with men's telephone. There are lots of exciting drugs in the pipeline, which, is now, which are now in trial. And uh, this is also a good question of whether this, uh, this CLL sort of uh, aspect, which can be applied to men's telephone, is that relevant in the future when we get the small molecules? Uh, and maybe can, uh, in the future, chemotherapy may play a lesser role. That's an open question, because as you see in the following, some of these regimens are still quite toxic, actually. Um, the lidomide, we had this uh, Nordic uh, study for first-line patients. Uh, it was uh, lidomide, it was antibody, it was bendamostin, rituximab here. And it was uh, a reduction with all three drugs. We had a, started with a phase, three, phase one study, Dose, try to find the dose of lidomide on top of uh, our benda, and then we would go on with a uh, single drug, uh, lidomide maintenance for, for, for uh, about seven months. And uh, it was turned out to be quite difficult to, to give this uh, with the chemotherapy. And we had to go down and leave it, had to leave it out of the first cycle because of rashes and because of uh, cytopenias. And we had to cut down on the dose, but we find actually we found a dose about 10 milligrams for two weeks in the induction phase here, and then in the in the uh, maintenance we could go up to uh, 50 milligrams for three weeks in, in these uh, four-week cycles actually. Here. <clears throat> and we had extraordinarily good responses; uh, all responded actually, and 90% in CR, and uh, most of the tested were PET negative and many also MRD negative, actually. So extraordinary good responses to this combination. However, um, it was difficult to tolerate the maintenance. So the, the gain on the PFS was not that striking. And this will be updated in Lugano in this year by, by Matt Jackman, who was the PI of this trial here. But interesting combination and uh, certainly a drug to keep an eye on also in the treatment of men in the coma. Uh, Bortezomib is, uh, is registered as a standard therapy in, in the US and uh, very, very uh, interesting drug also in first line combinations in men in the coma and Cavalli group was in this at ASCO last year. Uh, where they put it into the chop, take some of these things out of the chop, the neurotoxic thing, and then put in the potassium with the VR cat, compared to our chop in first line patients, and uh, got actually very impressive improvement of PFS, all, both of, of responses and of PFS. So, certainly, uh, potassium is a drug to keep an eye on also and put into combinations. And uh, this is probably what is going on in many centers now, trying to uh, fitting this drug into the current uh, therapy of mandatory in the uh, I just mentioned that uh, Ibuzinib, just I have only this slide because I haven't actually asked uh, Simon uh, permission to show this trial, but there is a trial being designed in Britain now with Ibuzinib 
uh, versus Ark Hemo in first line therapy, and probably Simon will mention it more when he t- will talk about uh, BCR inhibitors in uh, the next session. <clears throat> so, uh, what about uh, relapsed the refractory patients? Uh, and of course, this is a very important uh, question because you can see the curves here. They do relapse. It is an incurable disease. They do all relapse, and we have a big task to try to give these patients a decent uh, response to new treatment and also a decent life. And uh, of course, uh, bendamustine uh, was actually the first we heard about bendamustine management was, uh, was Rommel's uh, data in, in uh, 2005, where, where we could see that our bender was actually much better than previous uh, regimen and had a decent uh, about two-year median PFS in that series, and quite good responses also of the 16, of the 16 mantle cell patients in, in, that, in that trial. Um, I, I can just show you that uh, Carlo Visco has worked on a combination of RRC and bendamustine in relapsed patients with CLL, with a mental cell lymphoma. And there is a synergism between the two drugs shown in vitro. And the RBAC regimen combining R-benda and high dose RRC is very, very effective. I don't show it here because it is not maybe a very good regimen for the elderly. It's quite toxic. But you may consider to use it for a fit elderly patient and then use the lower dose of RRC that's 500 milligram per cycle in that. And that's quite effective and it could be considered for relapsed patients. Targeted therapy again in the, in the relapsed patients. Uh, this is, of course, a terrible slide, and I apologize for this. This is a table from, from Martin Dreiling and colleagues, a uh, big review article for, for the ESMO guidelines uh, last year. But I'll just go through some of these uh, many, many, uh, but just shows there's a huge activity out there trying to test an abundance of new small molecules, which actually makes it quite promising for all patients with mantle cell lymphoma in the future. So uh, temsulimus is, is an important mTOR inhibitor, but there's this riddle about the dose because it was, uh, it was actually registered on, on uh, this dose, 175 going to 75. But also, uh, and still by combining with rituximab got actually the same kind of responses. So, so uh, there's uh, something strange about the dose and we would personally go much more for the n cell doses when using Timsolimus in, in our, in our uh, practice. It's also being combined now with chemotherapy and it's feasible and promising and, and of course Georg is uh, the expert on this, uh, this, this drug here. <coughs> going back to the lutamide, the SPRINT trial has now uh, been shown at ASH this year with uh, uh, lutamide versus investigator's choice and at much better results with uh, lutamide, but it must be said that the investigator's choice was single drugs of therapy in the toxin that came side of the therapy or therapy. So not very strong opponents actually. So, but still it turns out it shows clearly this drug has a place in relapsed uh, refractory mental cell lymphoma. And now to the uh, important, uh, uh, probably most important aspect in, of, of treatment of relapsed uh, elderly patients with mental cell lymphoma. That is the BCR receptor inhibitors. This is a signalosome in, in, the, in the B cell, which you all know, with the, uh, with the uh, BTK, glutons, uh, tyrosine kinase, and the PI3K delta here. And the, uh, you can start with the brutonib, which inhibits, inhibits the glutons, kinase, uh, glutons uh, tyrosine kinase. And you, of course, you all know these uh, results from Wang's uh, uh, publication in the New England Journal in 2013. And it's, it's also a, it's a, it was important in the U.S. show that also in participant treated patients, this drug has an ex- immense eff- efficacy and actually with a very modest toxicity. So this is, of course, one of the most effective treatments of uh, relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. And 
as I showed you on the slide from Simon Rule, it's on its way up to frontline treatment now in, in mantle form and several combinations. So <coughs> uh, it's going to be it is going to be uh, it is registered now for the treatment of relapsed mantle form and CLL also. And uh, it's of course uh, the big the big issue of course is the cost, which uh, probably means that we are not any of us here in this room going to just go to Ibrusinib whenever a patient relapses. We have to sort of soberly try to see what worked on this patient the first time, how long did it work, and so on, and then carefully select our treatment for, for relapsed mental health. Otherwise, uh, we would, our, tax, our taxes will, will rise pretty, pretty high, I, I'm afraid. Uh, the Nordic Philemon chemo-free uh, uh, trial is for relapsed patients going to build on the uh, Lena Beard I showed you before, where it was a first-line treatment. We take out the chemotherapy and give the uh, rituximab and the lidomide in the reduction phase with ibrutinib and then go on with ibrutinib maintenance until progression. This is a trial which starts here in 2015 for relapsed and refractory mental health in the Nordic area. And it's, uh, it's, we certainly hope this is going to be show how to combine these two exciting drugs, lidomide and ibrutinib. Also going back to the signalosome, uh, the PI3K delta, uh, kinase, and ilanilzib. It was a drug that turned out to be, has some efficacy in terms of response, but alas, quite short, actually. So, so uh, there is activity in mantle lymphoma, but quite short, and this is not really a drug which we expect much of in mantle lymphoma in the future at least not alone. And finally, to the BCL2 inhibitor, the BH3 uh, mimetic. Uh, it's called BH3 only drugs because uh, of the BCL2 family. This uh, has only one uh, domain that was a BH3. That's what they call it. They call it BH3. It's quite simple, actually. And uh, uh, considering the huge overexpression of BCL2 in many B cell uh, neoplasms, including man cell form and CDL, of course. It's uh, simply trying to, you know, B cell 2 uh, binds the back back, which are the, the proteins which can polymerize and perforate the mitochondrial outer membrane and release cytochrome C and leading to apoptosis. And <clears throat> if you can sort of replace the back back with a BH3 uh, mimetic, then you can release it and, and go to this uh, apoptosis. And you have to sort of visualize a, a dam. BCL2 is a big dam holding back a huge reservoir of malignant cells. And you can, if you can take BCL2 out, it's just like the dam is bursting. So it's, a, it's a highly effective, but also you have to be careful that it's going to be really fast, and you have to have you can expect tumorizes, so you have to build it up very carefully. Uh, our data are mainly from CLL, but there are a, a, a study from from uh, it was Matt David's study at Ash in 2013, I think, where where we could see the few mantles actually had a 100% response, and maybe we'll hear more about it later in the next session. Uh, but but this is. A, in terms of response, the BCI inhibitors, the ibrutinib, and this drug, BCI2 inhibitors, are the ones to really keep an eye on in the future of treatment of, of, relap of relapsed man with lymphoma. And so, probably also uh, due time uh, first line. So using this algorithm from, adapted from, Simon, from uh, Campbell and Rule, a publication which can warmly be recommended, from blood 2015. In the elderly, of course, if you don't require therapy, you consider watch and wait, as shown early on. If you do need treatment and are not young and fit and fit for autograph, it is uh, art shop up in the Mustin. And uh, as in my practice, also up in the Mustin is followed by maintenance. 
I interpret the data from the RTOP trial so that it's uh, logical for me also to give R maintenance, even though it's not strictly documented. But I think we can afford that uh, sound conclusion that R maintenance is a benefit in managing the format. If you're not fit for this uh, fairly, uh, in terms of toxicity and efficacy, fairly equivalent uh, regimens, then you can go to something else. And if you go, like for chemotherapy, uh, actually, chlorambucil is not that bad in man cell form. I would really not recommend CVP. That's a bad regimen. It doesn't work. In the Nordic uh, Abraham some study I showed you before, this was actually a very bad regimen. Chlorambucil, and I have uh, palliated elderly patients with FC light excellently for years, actually, also. You can consider this uh, as, as an option also in elderly patients, uh, an oral FC light with a touch map is, uh, is tolerable for these patients. Also here, the question is maintenance, uh, and, and uh, this is not really documented, so it has to be explored in trials. For the relapsed patients, this is a moving target. And uh, I think if you have a, had a good uh, response duration, more than two years, again, thinking also economically, because we won't rush to a boost every time a patient relapses, then uh, I think you could soundly consider to repeat what, what worked earlier on if that, or, or other R chemo is. If you had a patient with R chop, go to R bender, maybe R back something sometimes. But of course, consider clinical trials. If you had a short duration response, again, consider clinical trials. We have lots of drugs to explore. And these trials are, are out there, so, so you, can, you can seek them up and, and try to, to come on. Uh, all you consider, Ibuzinib, in that case, it's, uh, it's fair to, uh, this is re re registered for that. Consider Arbatizumib, Arbatemsorimus, Arbatizumib. These options are there, and in, there are many ways to try to give elderly patients with elapsed management from a response and a decent uh, life as long as it lasts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine.